publicly expressing their dissatisfaction. Channel 8 will become the focal point for the people's demands for reform. The viable opposition and the crisis will come together to challenge 60 years of corruption, repression, and disregard for humanity <coughs> which the CCP has delivered to the Chinese people. So two of the three conditions for peaceful transition to democracy are now forming as we speak. And the third one, the stage is now set for America and the Western democracies to provide a third condition, international support. The timing is right because the situation is still manageable. Assertive engagement with China can push the government to engage in constructive dialogue with the opposition, a dialogue that will create a climate for peaceful and orderly democratic reform. Assertive American engagement with the Chinese government at this time can induce the Chinese government to realize that the tide of history is going against them. And now it's time to strike a bargain. Without a forceful and consistent message from America, now for the Chinese government to, to enter a dialogue with the opposition, the Chinese government will be lulled into a false sense of security that it can delay the inevitable, just as it did in 1989. That just as in 1989, it can intimidate and crush the opposition into submission. This could and probably will set in motion cataclysmic confrontations of unpredictable proportions. At the very least, America will have lost another opportunity to tip the scales toward democracy in China. America will lose a vital opportunity to eliminate the biggest challenge to its own security and for freedom of fully one quarter of the world's population. I must add at this time that America has little to lose and much to gain by assertively and consistently engaging China on the subject of democratic reform. Many argue that China will react by pulling the plug on their considerable holdings of U.S. debt. This is a self-imposed fear. The Chinese government knows better than we do. This will be suicide for them. China indeed will raise the volume and issue all sorts of threats, privately and even publicly. But I urge everyone to consider what happened earlier this year, actually earlier, last, earlier, last year, I think, yeah. But I urge, <coughs> yeah, when the European Parliament was about to award the Sakharov Prize for freedom of thought to the Chinese activist Wu Jia, the Chinese government made a forceful and even belligerent threat to the UP. Much to their credit, the European Parliament went ahead and awarded the prize to Zhu Jia. China did nothing more than issue a pro forma protest. At this critical moment, America cannot be driven by self-imposed fears. The condition for a peaceful transition to democracy are coming into play. The signers of China 08 are giving America and the world wake-up wake up call. We cannot afford to miss that call. We must engage with the democratic forces already work in China. I believe today more than ever that a visionary part of U.S. engagement policy with China is to openly and systematically engage with the Chinese democratic forces, the viable opposition, and to nurture its growth. We must send a clear and consistent message to the Chinese government that the time for constitutional reform has come. We must engage our democratic partners around the world to give China the same message. Specifically, <coughs> I strongly urge all 
of you involved in legislation to exercise this great tool of freedom to introduce resolutions that give a voice to our commitment to freedom. I applaud the Senate resolution introduced by Senators Casey and Brownback, supporting Channel 8, calling for the release of Liu Xiaobo, and urging democratic reforms in China. I congratulate Congressman McCarter for drafting a similar resolution for the House. Further, we must become proactive in our support of democracy. By proaction, I mean we should take actions that put Chinese government on the defensive in a way that forces them to confront the fact that they are on the wrong side of history and at the same time gives a hope to the democratic forces inside China. I will give you this example of proactive policy. I call it the doctrine of reciprocity. When US government officials travel to China, their movements, their contacts, and their communications are tightly controlled. If officials give a speech, it is not typically broadcast to the Chinese people. Congressman Chris Smith reported that on his last trip to China, he could not access his own website on the internet. Even President Obama's inauguration speech was edited before it was published in China. Virtually all American media are blocked in China, but here in the United States, China can freely broadcast. In fact, it is estimated that over 90% of the Chinese language media in the US are Chinese government controlled. The Chinese government uses such freedom to extend its influence with the Chinese communities in the United States. In the United States today, the Chinese government and its surrogates have a wide access to <coughs> our universities, think tanks, broadcast studios, through which they can advance their opinions and rationalize their actions. <coughs> When the Chinese government official speaks at universities such as Harvard and Yale, the government controlled media in China uses the association with these prestigious institutions to enhance its credibility and validity to its own people at home. Chinese citizens can protest here, but US citizens cannot protest in China. Under the doctrine of reciprocity, the United States would demand the same rights and freedom be extended to American citizens and officials and American media in China that we extend to Chinese citizens and officials and Chinese media here in the United States. In the exchange of ideas with China, we must demand level playing field. I firmly believe that it is not too late to summon our better angels and to stand on the right side of history. I must apply a much more strategic, we must apply a much more strategic yardstick to determine the right policies toward the Chinese government. We must realize that at the most fundamental level, we are <coughs> engaging in a struggle between two completely different views of humanity. One says, man is just a third of the state with no right. The other states that human beings have rights and it is the purpose of the state to protect them. In this regard, we must strive to restore human rights to its rightful place as the very fabric that binds our foreign policy together. This will not earn the retribution. This will not earn retribution of the Chinese government, but respect and realization that it is dealing with the people of a strength and a character. This is what the Chinese government fears most. This, more than anything else, will put America.